Number 10. New Car Smell There are few scents more satisfying, more universally tied to success and shininess, than the new car smell. You slide into the driver's seat, inhale deeply, and your brain is flooded with the aroma of achievement, freedom, and a cocktail of industrial poisons. Oh yeah, that glorious smell isn't the natural musk of premium leather and fresh opportunities. It's the scent of your car's interior slowly poisoning you. That smell is a complex bouquet of volatile organic compounds, or VOCs for short. Think of it as the car's newborn phase, where all the plastics, adhesives, vinyl, and flame retardants are still gassy. They're off-gassing. They're releasing a slew of chemicals like formaldehyde, benzene, and toluene into the sealed, unventilated box you're sitting in. Your dashboard, your seat cushions, your carpets, they're all basically farting out the remnants of their manufacturing process. Your brain interprets this chemical soup as new and clean, because we've been culturally conditioned to associate it with an expensive, untouched product. We smell it and think, nobody else's greasy french fry has been lost under this seat yet. But what you're actually smelling is the slow evaporation of the glues holding your console together, and the plasticizers that make your dashboard feel soft instead of brittle. It's the olfactory equivalent of licking a brand new shower curtain. So, next time you get a new car and someone says, oh, breathe it in, just smile, nod, and maybe crack a window. You know, to let the fresh air dilute the sweet, sweet aroma of progress and potential long-term health effects. Number 9. The smell of cut grass. Picture it. A perfect Saturday morning. The sun is out, a gentle breeze is blowing, and your neighbor is firing up their lawnmower. Soon, that iconic smell of freshly cut grass fills the air. It's the scent of summer, of lazy afternoons, of childhood. It's also the smell of pure, unadulterated panic. You're not smelling summer. You're smelling a billion tiny screams. When a blade of grass is sliced by a lawnmower, it doesn't just sit there and accept its fate. It launches a full-scale chemical defense. The plant releases a cocktail of compounds called green leaf volatiles, or GLVs. This isn't an aroma for our benefit. It's a plant's distress signal, a biochemical 911 call. One purpose of this scent is to signal to other parts of the plant to start producing compounds that can heal the wound and fight off potential infections from bacteria or fungi. It's the plant equivalent of slapping a tourniquet on a fresh wound. But it gets weirder. That smell also serves as a beacon for predatory insects. It's the grass screaming, Help! I'm being eaten by this giant, noisy monster. Would any wasps in the area care to come investigate and maybe murder whatever is doing this to me? Of course, a wasp isn't going to do much against a John Deere. But it might go after the caterpillars that are also chewing on the leaves. So, while you're sitting on your porch with a lemonade, thinking about how wholesome and relaxing it all is, you're actually eavesdropping on a desperate, chemical plea for survival. You find the scent of botanical trauma calming. Number 8. Old Book Smell Ah, the smell of an old book. Walking into a used bookstore or a library's forgotten corner and breathing in that dusty, slightly sweet, papery scent is a unique kind of magic. It smells like history, wisdom, and cozy afternoons. But what you're actually smelling is the slow, elegant process of decay. You are inhaling the ghost of a tree. Paper, especially older paper made before the 1980s, is full of organic compounds, primarily cellulose and lignin. Lignin is the stuff that gives wood its rigidity. It's the structural glue holding the cellulose fibers together. Over time, acids in the paper cause all these compounds to break down in a process called acid hydrolysis. It's a very, very slow chemical unraveling. As the lignin oxidizes and decomposes, it releases a whole symphony of volatile compounds. One of the most prominent compounds is vanillin, the very same chemical that gives vanilla its signature scent. That's why old books often have a faint, sweet, vanilla-like aroma. You're also smelling benzaldehyde, which gives off a hint of almond, and ethylbenzene, which has a vaguely sweet chemical scent. You're essentially sniffing a potpourri of decomposition. Each old book has a unique aromatic profile based on the type of paper, the ink used, and the environment it was stored in. So, when you press your nose into an old tome and take a deep whiff, you're not just smelling paper. You're smelling the slow, beautiful, and slightly morbid death of a forest product. It's the most romantic funeral you'll ever attend. Number 7. The Smell of Rain There's almost nothing better than the smell of the air right after a fresh rain, especially after a long dry spell. It's earthy, clean, and fresh. We call it petrichor, a fancy name for what is, essentially, the smell of liberated bacteria poop. 
Yes, that beloved poetic scent is largely produced by a group of soil-dwelling bacteria called actinomycetes. As they go about their tiny bacterial lives, munching on decaying organic matter in the soil, they produce a metabolic byproduct called geosmin. For centuries, this was just a thing that happened, unnoticed, in the dirt. But then it rains. When raindrops hit a dry, porous surface like soil or asphalt, they trap tiny air bubbles. These bubbles then shoot upwards, bursting from the water in a fizzy aerosol, carrying with them whatever tiny particles and chemicals were on the ground. This aerosol jet propels the geosmin into the air, allowing it to travel on the breeze and right into your waiting nostrils. Your nose is incredibly sensitive to geosmin. Humans can detect it at concentrations as low as a few parts per trillion. For perspective, that's like being able to smell a single spoonful of dirt in a hundred Olympic-sized swimming pools. We are better at smelling this specific bacterial waste product than sharks are at smelling blood. So next time you step outside after a storm, close your eyes and breathe in that fresh, clean air. Just remember, you're joyfully inhaling the aerosolized excrement of soil microbes. Nature is beautiful, isn't it? Number six, your dog's Frito feet. If you're a dog owner, you know the smell. You'll be cuddling with your furry best friend. They'll put a paw near your face and you'll get a distinct whiff of corn chips, Fritos specifically. It's a phenomenon affectionately known as Frito feet. And while it might seem like a weird quirk, you're actually smelling a tiny thriving ecosystem of microbes having a party on your dog's paws. Dog paws are a fantastic breeding ground for microorganisms. They're warm, they're sweaty, dogs sweat through their paw pads, and they're constantly picking up new friends from the ground. This damp, cozy environment is the perfect home for several types of bacteria and yeast. The two main culprits behind the corn chip bouquet are the bacteria Pseudomonas and Proteus. As these little guys go about their day, breaking down oils and sweat on your dog's paws, they release a variety of smelly chemical byproducts. And as luck would have it, their particular brand of waste products just happens to smell remarkably like processed corn snacks. It's usually harmless and just a normal part of your dog's personal scent profile. Think of it as their signature cologne. It's a testament to the fact that your dog is a walking, barking petri dish of fascinating microbial life. So, when you smell Frito feet, you're not imagining things. You're just getting an intimate sniff of the bacterial jamboree happening between your dog's toes. It's a little gross, a little weird, and somehow still kind of endearing. Number five, the clean smell. You've just spent hours scrubbing your bathroom. You step back to admire your work, the tiles gleaming, the chrome shining, and you take a big satisfying sniff of that sharp, sterile, clean smell. Whether it's bleach, ammonia, or a pine scented cleaner, your brain registers that chemical tang as the smell of a germ-free paradise. The problem is you're not smelling clean. You're smelling the absence of everything else masked by a chemical scream. At Kleinsied, clean itself doesn't actually have a smell. Pure water and pure air are odorless. What you're smelling are the powerful chemicals you've just used to commit mass microbial genocide. That sharp sting of chlorine from bleach is the smell of a chemical that obliterates germs by oxidizing them, violently ripping their molecules apart. That pine scent? It's often just a synthetic fragrance, a chemical called pinane designed to be so overpowering that it bullies every other scent molecule in the room into submission. It doesn't eliminate odors, it just shouts over them. Our brains have been trained by decades of marketing to associate these harsh industrial scents with hygiene and safety. We smell bleach and think, ah, no more germs. We smell artificial pine and think, ah, a forest of cleanliness. But in reality, you've just replaced the smell of natural biological life, even the gross parts, with the smell of a chemical factory. It's a comforting illusion. You haven't made the room smell clean. You've just made it smell like a successful chemical attack. Number four, the swimming pool smell. Nothing says summer vacation like the smell of a public swimming pool. That sharp chemical bite that stings your nostrils is a scent most of us instantly recognize as chlorine. We smell it and think, this pool must be super clean and disinfected. Well, prepare to have your childhood summers ruined. The stronger the chlorine smell, the nastier the pool is. Because what you're smelling isn't chlorine at all. It's the smell of chlorine reacting with pee. Chlorine itself, when it's just doing its job in clean water, has a very faint smell. The powerful eye-watering scent we associate with pools is actually a group of chemical compounds called chloramines. Chloramines are formed when chlorine disinfectant reacts with nitrogen-containing compounds. And what's a readily available source of nitrogen-containing compounds in a public pool? You guessed it. 
human waste. We're talking urine, sweat, body oils, and skin cells. When you dive in and that wave of chlorine hits you, you are inhaling the chemical byproduct of chlorine fighting a valiant, losing battle against the collective filth of everyone in the pool. A well-maintained pool with the proper chlorine to water ratio and not much organic material will have almost no smell. That overpowering chemical stench is a red flag. It's the pool's way of screaming. Too many people have peed in me and the chlorine can't keep up. Sambowan hasatao. So next time you walk into an indoor pool and the air is thick with that familiar smell, maybe just go for a walk instead. You're not smelling the disinfectant, you're smelling the evidence. Number three, the smell of mothballs. For a certain generation, the smell of mothballs is the smell of grandma's house. It's the scent of carefully stored woolen sweaters and dusty attics. It's a bit of an odd, pungent smell, but it's tied to nostalgia. It's also the smell of a solid-state poison designed to turn into a toxic gas. That nostalgic scent isn't just repelling moths. It's actively fumigating your closet. Mothballs are made from one of two main chemicals, naphthalene or paratochlorobenzene. Both of these substances have a very low sublimation point, which means they turn directly from a solid into a gas at room temperature. This is key to their function. They're not like citronella candles that moths just find unpleasant. They are a pesticide. The gas that comes off the mothball fills the enclosed space of your closet or chest, and the fumes are toxic to moths and their larvae, killing them on contact. The problem is, those fumes aren't exactly great for you either. Naphthalene is classified as a possible human carcinogen, and exposure can cause nausea, headaches, and dizziness. Paradichlorobenzene is a little less toxic, but it's still not something you want to be huffing on the regular. When you open a sealed container and get a big whiff of that mothball smell, you are inhaling a concentrated dose of pesticide gas. The entire point of the product is to create a toxic, unlivable atmosphere for small creatures. So that scent of a well-preserved past is literally the smell of a tiny personal gas chamber for your clothes. Sweet dreams. Number two, the musty basement smell. You walk down the stairs into a basement and it hits you. That damp, earthy, musty smell. It's the universal scent of underground rooms, old cellars, and places where sunlight fears to tread. We often just accept it as the way basements smell. But that iconic mustiness isn't the smell of old concrete or forgotten furniture. It's the smell of mold breathing. You are inhaling microscopic mold farts. That signature smell is caused by microbial volatile organic compounds, or MVOX. When mold and mildew find a nice, damp, dark place to live, like your basement, they start to grow and digest whatever organic material they can find. This could be wood, drywall, cardboard boxes, or even dust. As they metabolize their food, they release these gassy MVOX into the air. It's the exhaust from their biological engines. Different species of mold produce different types of MVOX, creating a unique smelly signature. But they all contribute to that general musty profile. So when you smell that odor, it's a direct announcement that there is an active mold colony somewhere nearby, happily eating your house and reproducing. It's a biological air raid siren. And while the smell itself is just an annoyance, it's a clear indicator of a potential problem that can cause allergies, respiratory issues, and structural damage. Your nose is giving you a crucial warning that you're sharing your home with a thriving fungal roommate who doesn't pay rent and has terrible, smelly gas. Number one, the smell of garbage. All right, this one seems obvious. Garbage smells bad, duh. But the reason. It smells so uniquely, profoundly awful is a masterclass in the chemistry of decay. When you take out the trash, you're not just smelling old food. You are smelling a complex biochemical soup orchestrated by a ravenous army of microbes. And it includes chemicals that are literally named after death. As soon as you throw food scraps into a bag, bacteria, yeasts, and molds begin a feeding frenzy. They break down proteins, fats, and carbohydrates into simpler and much smellier compounds. The sour, rancid smell? That's from butyric acid, the same compound found in vomit. The rotten egg smell? That's hydrogen sulfide, produced by bacteria breaking down sulfur-containing amino acids. But the true stars of the Garbage Can Horror Show are two compounds called putrescine and cadaverine. Yes, you read that right. Cadaverine. These chemicals, part of a group called diamines, are produced during the anaerobic breakdown of amino acids in decaying animal tissue. Their names are brutally literal. They are key components in the stench of rotting flesh and decaying corpses. When you smell your overflowing kitchen garbage, especially if there's old meat or fish in there, 
you are getting a whiff of the exact same chemicals that give a dead body its characteristic odor of putrefaction. It's a primal biological signal hardwired into our brains to scream. Danger! Rotting matter! Do not eat! So your garbage can isn't just a bin of trash. It's a miniature laboratory for the science of rot. A fragrant monument to mortality. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.